great. I don't know what they're going to do anymore. That's the suspense. That's what's good about it. Take your Bibles. <laughs> it's one thing good about church, man. You ought to have fun in church. When church becomes boring, you ought to go find something else to do. I uh, really, wait a second. Let me take that back. <laughs> you guys might go do it. Take your Bibles. Go to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. A couple verses. And then, uh, that's a good song. You know, you ought to learn how to fight. You got to fight, man. Uh, fighting is one of the, the things you got. 14, Proverbs 24. I, I probably ought to get there. 24, 11. 24, 11. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, does not he that pondereth the hearts consider it? Question mark. And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? Question mark. And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Lord, uh, thank you for the singing up to this point. Thank you for all you've done up to this point. Thank you for just getting us here today. Uh, Lord, thank you for everything you've done. Lord, uh, it is a blessing, Lord, that we just thank you and praise you one more time, Lord. Uh, and that will keep us going for another a couple hours if that's what it takes. Uh, Lord, we'll worry about the next couple hours later on down the road, but uh, Lord, just want to thank you right now for what you've done. Uh, bless the morning service, Father, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a great song, man. I, I, you need to praise him. I was telling the Sunday school class, I was reading through my Bible, I started going through it four times a year. Not that you have to, but I mean, I get depressed every time I read through there. I, as I'm going through, I mean, everybody just messes up, man. I mean, there's just no hope. And then, then here's Moses. You know, every now and then you find somebody that does right, Moses, he doesn't do right all the time, but he does right enough that the Lord, Lord recognizes him. And he goes, Moses, M Moses looked at all the people and said, I know, the Lord's done told me, I know that the moment I leave, you guys are all going to mess up. And I'm like, Lord, I was probably some of those guys. I said, I was one of those. I said, there's just a matter of time. I mean, every time, it's, it's a matter of time before people mess up. I'm like, it's a matter of time. I said, and he, you know what the Lord told me? He said, hey. You got stuff to do today. You haven't messed up yet. So let's get up and go do what you got to do today. We'll worry about messing up later. And, and I'm like, well, thank you that I have something to do today. Amen. One more time, I got something to do. One more time, and I can thank you that, hey, I got through the day without messing up a whole bunch real, real bad. Thank you that you got me through the day. And guess what? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Worry about today, today, and tomorrow will take care of itself tomorrow. It'll, it'll handle itself. But if you worry about tomorrow, oh, what am I going to do tomorrow, the next day? Oh, i got to do this, i got to do this. You're way, way too far out in the future. One day at a time is all you have to worry about. I like it, man. I like it. Proverbs. You know what the title of this message is? The servant's least developed ability in his, in his greatest duty. Your least developed ability is winning souls. You know that? That's what we're here for. If you're in here today and you're lost, you know the best thing you can do is get saved. Because that's, that's what the church's responsibility is. Whether you believe it or not, that's really what it is. What the devil wants to do is get us tied in, but all this other stuff out here that any, any good. Ezekiel 7, have you ever read your Bible? I like my Bible, man. It's crazy. Four times a year might be a little much. I don't know. It's going to mess me up. I already know it's messed me up. Two times was bad enough. Four is going to really do it. Uh, Ezekiel 3.17 says this. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Now, you could say, oh, that's, well, that's written back. Ezekiel saying that to Israel. Yeah, but that's, you know what Jesus came? Jesus came to be a watchman until the world. You know what I am? I'm his disciple. I'm a child of God. You know what that makes me? A watchman. I know the truth. I know the truth. And watch this. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the words at my mouth. You ever read his Bible? You and I have so much more than Ezekiel had, than Je uh, Jeremiah had, than Moses had, than Isaiah had, than Elijah had. You have it all. He said, the words of my mouth, and give them warning for me. Therefore, hear the words. That, that's your job is to give them warning. No guarantee they're going to do anything. When I say unto the wicked, boy, I'll tell you what, you, you can, it's easy to find wicked. Number one, we're all a bunch of wicked. <laughs> you got them right here. But you go out into this world, the world's full of wicked people. We keep trying to justify what the wicked is doing so we can become part of that. I never understood that. I'm kind of this black and white kind of guy. Uh, it's either there's really no gray area. I know right when I'm messed up. I already know it. You don't have to tell me this, this gray area. This is really messed up. My flesh wants to do this and my spirit wants to do this. Uh, I sometimes linger into this area right here. But before I get to here, man, I'm, I'm like right here and I'm fighting to get back over here. I know what that stuff is. 
He says, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. That's what God has said. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this a judgment. Uh, heaven and hell, heaven was made for the devil, was, was made for us. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. Over in, in uh, uh, Luke chapter 16, 19, uh, the rich man says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. You know what the Bible says? Clearly all through this stuff, he says, I am going to judge the wicked. They're going to die. And they're going to go to a place called hell, whether they ever hear it or not. But he says, you know, you're responsible. Brethren, the hardest thing we'll ever do is learn how to be a witness. Jesus Christ said, I have come to seek. And over in Luke, he adds to that and save that which was lost. Well, if I'm his disciple, man, what am I supposed to be doing? When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning. I remember the first time I read this. I mean, that's years and years and years. I've been saved 43 years. I probably read this thing and understood it probably 40 years ago. Lord says, hey, you know what keeps me going? He told me right there. I already know what I'm supposed to be doing. People say, well, I want, I want, I want to know about the tribulation. Why? You're not going to be there. Amen. There's plenty of books on the tribulation. God, I tell you what, go to Bible college. Dr. Pickock's got a school down there. You can learn all that stuff. Easy. Three years. Take the first year. We got a couple people in here. They love it, man. But what are you doing? I mean, if we're just always intaking and never putting it back out, what good is it? And then you get somebody say, well, I believe in the gap. Well, I don't. Then you got an argument going on. What good was that? I believe the earth is flat. I think if you think the earth is flat, you are out of your mind. But however, comma, I've, I've argued. I went to Bible college with a guy, sit right next to him through Bible college for three years. He believes the earth is flat. I'm like, I believe you're a moron. <laughs> How could you possibly you say, well, I believe the earth is flat. Well, you're a moron too. And oh, you know what that just did? It just gendered an argument between us. That's not what we're here for. I don't go up to say somebody, let me tell you about the earth being flat. <laughs> See what that does for you. You know, that's what people want. They want to come, they want something new. They're just like Mars Hill. We're no different. We want to come to church. We want this new thing, always new. It's got to be new. Why is it new? I like, you haven't dealt with the old stuff yet. He says, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way. I like street preaching. You're like, this is my precursor message for street preaching. I'm going to start street preaching here real soon. I don't care if nobody goes out with me or not, man. I'm just going to go. I like it, man. People get mad. They cuss you. They yell at you. They do all kinds of stuff out there. They throw stuff at you. I mean, it's cool as anything. You might not think this is cool, but to me, this is cool because I like to get a reaction. And this world will give you a reaction in a heartbeat, man. I mean, you'll get some people going, oh, praise God, hallelujah, I'm glad you're doing this. We need more people like them. Why aren't you out here with me? No, no. You know, it's street preachers, it's easy, man. You find your red light that's busy. you got just a couple minutes that you're going to possibly irritate anybody. <laughs> and they're going to go on, and you'll get a whole new group. All you have to do is know three or four verses. You don't have to know a whole bunch. For God, for God. For God, that's all you got to have. I like my Ten Commandments sign. I got a Ten Commandments sign. All you can really read is the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments are actually too little to read. But, boy, that's enough right there to get them. Ten Commandments. Well, I don't live under the law, but, I mean, that's good to have because it's a good starting point. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. If nothing more, by the time you get done going through the Ten Commandments, you know you're messed up. Somewhere in one of those ten, he only had to give you ten. I mean, really, he could have probably got away with four or five. <laughs> Could have really gave you one, and it got us all. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. How about that one, man? That's really the only one you need. Catholic Church don't like that one. I was Catholic. I know, man. They got rid of it. <laughs> Yet if thou warn the wicked. So see, I'm going to tell you how you get out of your trouble. You just tell everybody you can that they're going to hell. I got on a ship out there, man. I got so mad at God one time. I mean, I, you ever got mad at God? I get mad at him all the time. I've learned not to get so mad at him anymore. Because I, I realize he can do stuff now that he, back then he just had grace and mercy. And he still has grace and mercy because he don't kill me like he could. But I used to get mad. I said, look, I ain't going to tell nobody nothing no more. He goes, that's what I told you, you idiot. I said, if you're not, you can't save somebody. All you can do is tell them. And what's wrong is you get frustrated because you don't get a response. After the first or second admonition, reject him as a heretic. I've done told you what to do. You won't do it. So then you don't tell nobody nothing. That's like a Jeremiah syndrome. And then it starts burning inside and you can't shut up. I said, okay, Lord, I'll tell you what. I'll tell them everybody once or twice. 
and then I'll shut up and go find somebody else. You know, there's always somebody else to tell. And there's always somebody else to tell. And there's always somebody else to tell. And I said, when these guys come back and start asking questions, I'll, start, I'll give an answer. And I watched them guys start coming back little by little. And next thing you know, they start getting saved. And people said, how did that happen? You just, you do what the word says. You do what the Bible says. Quit trying to do it your way. He goes, yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked ways. So there is a chance that they will turn. But if they don't, that's not your baby. That's not your problem. That's theirs. You know, in 1980, I made a choice on a back porch in Louisville, Kentucky, and I turned from my wicked ways. You say, well, you're still wicked. Yeah, I know, but it's not as wicked. It's not as bad. I'm changed directions. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm going home. And then he says, well, tell people. I'll tell you what, man, it's, it's easy to talk about Jesus. Well, I'll tell you what, if you've ever met Jesus, it's easy to talk about him. This world wants to take everything from you and keep you from doing it. Uh, it says, again, when the righteous man, so there's righteous people who mess up that need to hear the word of God. Doth, uh, turn, uh, he says, again, when the righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him a warning. You know where that puts the responsibility? On me. They're going to suffer for it. But it's given the indication that the Lord's going to hold me accountable because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. How are they supposed to hear unless a preacher tells them? And guess what? You don't have to go to Bible college to be a preacher. Any good wife is a preacher. <laughs> you, got, you ladies scare me to death. That bathroom in there, if you walked in the bathroom today, the floor is tiles white. Do you like it, Marianne? Okay, good. So is it good or negative? Okay. I sit there the other day and I needed that carpet. And here's my dilemma. It's bad enough that I take the nursery down for two and a half weeks. If I take this bathroom down and the ladies can't get to the bathroom, I'm going to have everybody in this church mad at me. I mean, you're talking about mad ain't even the word. I said, so Thursday, I get this brilliant idea that I'm going to steal the carpet out of the ladies' bathroom to fix the nursery. And the Lord says, you know, you got a whole stack of tile out in your truck. You can tile this floor. Everybody thinks I'm not. That's crazy, man. I don't care. I said, i got to get this thing back online, and they have to be able to walk through this thing. First of all, i got to get it online so the guy can carpet this side tomorrow. Then i got to get this thing back online so they can walk to the bathroom on Sunday, or there's going to be a revolt. You know, when you tear something apart sometimes, you got to stop and think, man, how am I going to do this, Lord? I can't. You can't there's, that guy want to do some work in church. I said, you got I said, whatever you do, this thing has to be ready for Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I don't care what else you do. But I, those days, you can't. Everything has to be planned like in those two or three days, and, and you have to kill yourself. I was thanking God, man. I don't have anything in here that I have to do that in this church ever again, I don't think. Unless we tear the end off and put a new building on. And that's down the road somewhere. But he says, tell them. Tell them, man, tell them. You're a preacher. You're a preacher. Every one of us has been given the word of God to go out and tell. Mary and Martha were, were able to go tell. Uh, Mary Magdalene was going to go able to tell. I bet you the leper went out and told people. I bet you Lazarus, when he came back from the dead, didn't shut his mouth a whole lot. Peter, James, and John, every example I got in the Bible, men who really met Jesus Christ had something to say. He says, nevertheless, verse 21, if thou warn the righteous, and the righteous uh, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. You know what? We need to hear the truth sometimes. Guess who does that? People. You know how you, you put people in conviction by your life. Have you ever, has, has somebody ever just irritated you because they live trying to live a clean life and just irritating you because you want to go do what you think and want to do? And you don't care what God says, but God puts this person in front of you with a smile on your face? And you're just telling them about Jesus and talking about Jesus and bubbling over about Jesus. And you're irritating them to no end. They don't even know what, you don't know what you're doing to them, but you're irritating them. You know, the best thing you do is keep a smile on your face and talk about Jesus. That'll keep, I like Jesus. I don't know. I'm going to get, got, my name's Mike, by the way, but they got these, I like Mike. I like Ike. I, I'm going to get, I love Jesus. I got a hat, man. All my hats are relax. Jesus is in, God's in control. He is, man. He's in, ni, ni, shu, tsu. I probably said that all wrong, but that's okay. He's a Chinese guy. A lot of you know him a different name, but that's his name right there. He was, he was raised by a, a, uh, a Christian family. In 1929, uh, 28, he changed his name to Watchman, Watchman Nee. 
You know what he did? He went over there and he became a watchman to the Chinese people. He went and told them and told them and told them and told them. His name was not originally Watchman. It became Watchman later on down the road. You know what? He wanted everybody to know what he was. His life was okay until the communists took over. And I mentioned this in Sunday school, but then they locked him up for 15 years, and 20 years later he dies in prison. Now, you know what bothers me is a lot of people say, well, Watchman Nee was wrong here. Yeah, but you don't live like he lived to get across what he got across to some people that you couldn't even deal with, and he died in prison. How about you? Are you living in the lap of luxury? Is that where you are? Is that where it is? That's not Christianity, Christianity that it used to be. My Lord didn't live like that. Peter didn't live like that. James didn't live like that. John didn't like that. And Paul and Luke didn't either. And all the people in Fox's Book of Martyr didn't do too good either. Watch when he said this. Good is not always good. Good is not always God's will. But God's will is always good. I like that, man. A drowning man. Are you a drowning man today? If you're lost, you're a drowning man. A drowning man cannot be saved until he is utterly exhausted and ceases to make the slightest effort to save himself. You remember when you got saved? I do. I said, I said I'm done, man. I said, there ain't no hope for me. I'm done. You know, right then I got saved. I sat there and told the Lord, I said, I need you, and without you, I'm, I'm done. I'm on my way to hell, and there ain't no way out of it. You're not wrong. I'm wrong. You're right. I'm wrong. What do I do? And boy, Jesus starts falling out of the pages of my Bible. <laughs> That's great, man. We must be brought to a place where naturally given. Oh, no, here. We must be brought to a place, place where naturally gifted, though we may be, we dare not speak except in conscience and continual dependence on him. You know what you got to do? It's the hardest thing in the world. Lord, what should I do? I know what I can do. I know what I'm able to do. But, Lord, what should I do? Should I do this? And get the flesh completely out of the way. Watch me. He was a great guy, man. Attempting to follow him without denying the self is the root of all failures. Man, I'm telling you what, this thing has got to get out of the way. The moment you let this thing get back in the way, we think we know better than somebody else. You know, God knows exactly how. He set some things up, man. He set it up, Adam, to be the leader, and Eve to follow Adam. Any way other than that. Now, ladies, I'm not mad at y'all at all, man. Y'all are you're smart ladies, I, I tell you. Uh, my wife helps me get through all kinds of stuff. Any other way other than that is an abomination. I'm telling you, any other way other than that, sort of, it, it won't work. We're going against what God said. I'll get into some of that here in a few minutes. It's easy. It's so easy to become more attached to the gifts of God than to the giver. And even, I should add, to the work of God than to God himself. Proverbs 11.30 says this. I'm, I'm just about to message. be done in a couple seconds. That one's getting a message. Proverbs 11.30, the, uh, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. You know, it says it's better to be wise than to be rich. It's better to gain wisdom than gold. We got that thing backwards. We think gold is the answer, the funds of the money and all that. No, wisdom, wisdom. What's wisdom? I came to seek and save that which was lost. Simple thing. As simple as you could get it. We, this world, oh, oh man, you don't even, just wait a second. <laughs> I'm going to get somebody today. I know him. Daniel 12.3. I like all these up. These verses are in my Bible, man. I love these verses every time I come across them. And then you want to you wanna be what God wants you to be? And they that be wise. Well, if you're wise and you win his souls, this is what's going to happen to you. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. You ever looked at the sun during the day? You can't look at it. It hurts your eyeballs. That'll be you in heaven if you do what's right. Otherwise, you're going to be this dim thing over in the corner. <laughs> As the brightness, of, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's what the Lord came to do. If we're going to follow after his steps, you know that's what we do. The only one, he had 12 disciples. The only one among the 12 apostles who did not become a missionary became a traitor. You're going to be one or the other. You can't be both. You can't sit. He says, over in Revelation, he talks about being on a, on a fence. You're lukewarm. He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I don't want to be spit out of his mouth. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't care if the whole world is lukewarm. I don't have to be that. Amen. You know what I need to do is say, Lord, what would you have me do today? And I'm going to do. You say, well, doing a bathroom is the Lord's will? Yeah. 
Boy, I tell you what, I got some, I got some little kids running around here that grow up in the nursery. I want them to think that this is their church. You know, it says you should leave stuff to your children and your children's children. I hope I don't leave them a dime. I want to leave them a church. You know what's better than a dime? A church. A place where they can get the word of God. That's much better than any amount of money you'd ever give them. I want my grandkids and their grandkids and their kids, if the Lord tarries, to be raised in a church somewhere. Hopefully this one. There ain't nothing else out there. Luke 15, 10, likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. You got a sinner in here today? If you're a sinner and you need to repent, there's joy in, 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 oh, with the angels when you do that. Are you lost today? Abraham, Abraham's servant. You know what Abraham, uh, Eliezer, and I, I'm just, I just got a little note here about him, but Eliezer, man, you know what he got the privilege to do? Not go get something for Eliezer. He got to go get something for Abraham. Isaac's son, he got to go get his bride. Our Lord left. You know what I am? I'm the bride of Christ. But I got a, I got a, a secondary job that's more precious than anything else. I get to add people to that. Uh, Beth, there's a lady that'll be here tonight, Linda. She got saved a couple Sunday mornings ago. And Beth was talking to her, and, and she goes, uh, she goes, she didn't say, Have you been reading your Bible? I asked her. She goes, She had, Have you been reading your Bible? God, so willing. You've been teaching people. Other than that. No, she goes, Anything change? She goes, yeah, I had a good night's sleep. Man, I've been sleeping good. You know what that is, man? That's a burden. That's a load lifted. I remember the night I got saved on that back porch. I didn't know I got saved. I had no idea I got saved, but I went back to bed, and I slept all night, man. <laughs> I had a good night's sleep. I, I woke up the next morning. I told Beth this. I said, man, that was one of the best nights of sleep I ever had in my life. I didn't even know what happened. I didn't realize drugs had went away, I, that I had quit doing some stuff. I didn't even realize that. Three weeks later, man, I'm pretty dumb. I'm from Kentucky, man. You got to give me a break. I thought, wait a second, I'm not doing that anymore. What in the world happened? And I went back to that night on that back porch, and then I looked up at the sky and said, hey, what did you do? What did you do? You did something, man, and he did it. Abraham got sent his servant. He trust, first of all, he trusted his servant. Can God trust you? He gave us a book. He, and he said, if you don't read this thing, there's no way he can help you. And then he's going to blame you. Just, I just, this is for the Christians now. He's going to blame you when you get to heaven because you didn't read his book. I'm a moron. I'm telling you now that I am not, I am not the most, the sharpest knife in the drawer when it comes to admin stuff. I hate admin. I hate paperwork. I hate, this, is the, this is so far out of my realm, I can't even tell you how far I, this is out of my realm. You say, no, it's not. It's, this is outside of my realm. You want me to build a building? Piece of cake. You want me to fix a ship? I know, I fix an airplane. I don't care. You don't even have to tell me how to do it. I'll go do it. This scares me to death. Every single time I get behind this pulpit, I'm scared to death. I wake up, Lord, I don't have nothing. What do you want me to preach? What do you want me to preach? What do you want me to preach? I don't know what to say. I said, this isn't my stuff. This is yours. It's not mine. It's yours. What do you want? What do you want? And he says, do this. I said, okay, I can do that. I, this is easy. Uh, tell somebody about Jesus the easiest thing you'll ever do. It's the hardest thing and the easiest. To get you open your mouth, because you think that if you say something, it's going to bother, going to get you in trouble. Who stinking cares? If you get fired, maybe you needed to get fired and go get another job. You got that one, didn't you? Maybe God will give you a better one. I don't know, man. Who cares? We sit there. I remember when Phil Nestle told me to quit passing out. He found one in ten buildings away, and he said, "And I'm in building one." He goes. Elliot calls me up to his office. Elliot, this is a great story ever told or something like that. He said, quit passing these out. This. I said, how do you know it's me, man? Don't have no name on it or nothing. He goes, you're the only one around here that do that. I worked with Steve. Steve just backslid, man. He would never do that. <laughs> no, he was. <laughs> there were some other Christians in that building. They didn't do it. Why don't you blame them? What would you call me into your office? I mean, how many people were out at Lexus? Yeah. 3,000 people, and you call me in? From a building that's way across the, I mean, way, way far away and think that I did that? I may have done it. <laughs> go in the bathroom, man. If you got a, you chicken, go in the bathroom with a stack of tracks and just put them on all the toilet paper holders. Guess what? When people sit down, they got to do something. You never can't tell, man. Say, well, I build enough courage, man, to, to, so, so I can get out there today and give somebody a track face to face. The approach. The approach is always a good way to do it. 
Just if you walk up to somebody, you, you ever, I like going to jails. Jails are cool. If you ever get, a, get it up, go to jail. Because the bars, I've watched people talk to people in a bar, can't get nothing started. So you go up, I, man, I can get something started at a jail easy, easy. I mean, it'd take me a couple minutes because you got to figure out who's in there <laughs> and, and their attitudes and why they get all mad. And, and you got to find something to just irritate someone. And because the moment you get, it's like stirring up a bee's nest, man. You get one irritated and the rest of them are going to be irritated. Pretty soon you got a, bar, a, a whole front people right there ready to talk to you in a heartbeat. And then you'll get one or two that actually want to hear. And I'm telling you what, it's a blessing. But you got to sit there, you got to approach some people sometimes. You don't always have to throw, you're going to hell in their face. You, hey, if you're around somebody all the time, just a general conversation's great. But brethren, you were here for that. That's what we're here for. The issue. Brethren, Paul said this. I read this just the other day. Paul said this right here in 10. There's a, well, let me get back to the one. There's a natural way. Uh, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. Just a, and then there's a direct way. Are you a Christian? You know what the, most people, I asked that lady here the other day. I said, are you saved? One of the first things I said to her. She's sitting in church. She's singing all the songs. She's doing everything. Beth had already mentioned some stuff to me. And I, I went up and said, hey, I said, let me ask a question. Are you saved? If you died tonight, do you know you'd go to heaven? And she goes, no. She said, I'm not saved. I said, wouldn't you like to be saved? She said, I sure would. <laughs> so I went through some things with her. And me and Beth and her sitting right here. And within about five or ten minutes, she trusted Jesus Christ sitting in church, man. It still happens in church, you know. You just got to say, hey, how am I going to deal with this person but if you're lost, you know, sometimes people just don't walk up and say, hey, are you saved? There's nothing wrong with asking somebody that. You're not hurting them. What you're doing is you're giving them, you're telling them that they, they need something more than what they have. I got I had to get it. I wasn't mad at God because he was going to, I remember that man, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'm, I'm waiting to get to heaven. I'm gonna, I, I laughed. I said, I remember he showed me who he was by John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. It's the father the dove, like a, the Holy Spirit, like a dove, and Jesus in the water. Now, I'm a Catholic, and I know the story. I'm, that's all we've ever was told is the story right here. I mean, we knew that right there. Mary had a baby, and his name was Jesus. That's about it, you know. And she's immaculate, and, and just say that our Father and, and the Hail Mary is about 47 times. Keep a rosary around your neck, a couple of scapulars, and you're good to go. Uh, <laughs> come back Sunday, uh, Saturday, confession, Sunday, communion, you're good to next week. I don't know what would happen if you die between point A and point B, you're in trouble. Purgatory, that's where purgatory is at. You would think that they'd have purgatory for like a week, because that's all you would really be messed up from Sunday to Saturday, is just one week of mess up is all you could have, because everything's supposed to be covered, but it, it doesn't work that way. Millions and millions of years from now in purgatory, I don't want to go to purgatory. Purgatory just don't sound good to me, no matter how you look at it. But anyways, I mean, you sit there and say, Lord, Lord, what a... What do I do, man? What do I, here, I got this book. I got this word. I got, I got everything else. I said, how do I get saved? And, and I didn't get mad at anybody. I didn't get mad at God. I didn't get mad at nobody else. I just sit there and looked at it. You know, a lost person, most of the time, know they're lost. And they want to get, get closer, but they don't know how. And all, really, if we just sit there and say, hey, let me tell you how to get to the Savior. And if they don't hear it, you've done your job. If they do hear it, you've won a soul. And help somebody else who had done their job earlier. I don't think somebody gets saved immediately. The direct way, it's always direct. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. No, I'm not. I've had people tell me they're a Christian, and you start talking to them, and, and you're like, yeah, you're kind of far away from that. Romans 10, the issue. The issue is Romans 10. One, brethren, Paul knew this. Paul's talking to a bunch of Gentiles, and he goes, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You know, Paul... Paul got something that uh, the blindness in part has come to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's us. Paul got something, got the truth, and then he started looking at his people, and he said, my people are lost, and they're dying, and they're going to hell, and I don't know what to do, and they won't listen to me, and, and all they want to do is stone me and kill me and, and anybody else. They don't want Jesus, and that's what they need. And he goes on, he says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. There's a lot of people with zeal, but it's the wrong zeal. You need that zeal for the Lord. We're, you're held responsible for what you know. And you say, well, I didn't know that. No, I just, well, I just told you that. You're held responsible. If you're a Christian in here today, you're responsible to tell those that's around you that God put in your path. You need to figure it out. Uh, there's a guy in, in New Hebrides. His name was John Getty, Reverend John Getty. Uh, there was a marble slab over there for him. In, in that, And it says, when, when he came here, there were no Christians. 
He goes, but when he left and went away, there were no heathen. You know what the guy did? He just started going over and, went and figured out what to do. You don't have to do. Man, I was in Croatia. I took Beth over. I was going to be a missionary to Croatia. I'm sitting over praying. Praying's good. I'm telling you what, brethren, praying's good. I got some prayer books. I got like four or five of them. I got some more. I'm looking for some people who will take these prayer books and read them. Prayer will change your life. If you don't think you need a prayer book, if you don't need that, this isn't a prayer book like, oh, God. Not like the Catholic prayer book. This is Ian Bounds, Complete Works. It tells you what prayer is, the essentials of prayer, why you pray, why you need to pray. You need to get that with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, you need to. You say, well, I don't want, then you're going to go through life not knowing what to do. And you're going to die one day. If you're saved, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of why you didn't do when he's going to say, that moron preacher got up here and told you he had books and he'd give you one. And you don't even have to buy it. I'll give it to you. Then I'll charge the church. No, I won't. <laughs> Bible says, buy the word and sell it not. I'm telling you what, you might think this is crazy. But I do that all the time. I get Bibles away. I hate, I hate, man, I buy them 50, 60, 70 bucks. I, church Bibles, you can get them. I hate getting them. Somebody, I had a Cambridge Bible, man. They were expensive Bibles. And I, I had one, and it says, buy the word. So I said, here, just take it. I, I don't know what to do with it. It says buy it, but you can't sell it, man. I don't know how you know, these presses, printing presses stay in business. None of them can be of God. <laughs> They're all selling them, man. I don't see how they could. I had to buy them to get them. Jesus deals with Nicodemus over in 3.3. Nicodemus comes to him asking questions. Here's a ruler of you. The, my favorite verse in that whole passage, go over to uh, John chapter 3. Well, I tell you what, could you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ talking to you? What a blessing. I can't wait for that day to happen. I think I'm just going to shut up and listen. And let him ask me some questions. And <laughs> He's talking to Nicodemus. Go down to verse 10. Jesus, after talking to Nicodemus for a little while, this is, this is your educated man. This is the guy who's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's, he's a ruler of the Jews. It says in verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He's out there. He's up there. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master? Not just, he's, he doesn't have a, 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 just a, a one-year degree or a two-year degree or a bachelor's degree. He's got a master's degree. He's out there. He's a master. He said, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? You know, he sits there and says, you must be born again. You must be born. Let me ask you a question. Are you born again today? Are you sure you're born again? I am born again. I am born, born again. I am born again. I got born again in 1980 on the back porch. I've been born again ever since. I am not dead anymore. Uh, I might not live like I should live, but I am not dead. I am alive, and I got a story to tell. And so do you. You got something that this world needs more than anything else out there. But we talk about all this other stupid, idiotic stuff and never tell them about Jesus. It's crazy stuff, man. I'm, I don't, I'm just messed up. I tell the world, I'm telling you, you got the wrong guy for this job. Nicodemus, he says, some things Nicodemus knew going into the conversation. He knew there was a heaven and a hell. Most people you talk to know about that. They've heard it enough. They know there's a heaven and hell. Heaven was the desired destination, by the way. And Nicodemus knew that. Hell is not a desired, I don't even know why anybody would hesitate once they understand there's a heaven and hell. It makes no sense why anybody would do that, but they do. He didn't have all the answers. That's why he came to Jesus by night. Number one, he was afraid of everybody looking at him coming during the daytime, so he sneaked slither over at nighttime and say, hey, I know you're a ruler and your master come from Jesus. Tell us that you're from God. Tell me. He was willing to listen. The key to this thing is listening. I don't know. I don't know. Let me know. And the Lord starts showing you. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He'll build that thing up in you. He was willing to change what he thought and he knew. You know, the, if you can get somebody to change what they're thinking, if it's wrong, that's, that's huge. But you got to give them time to change. I can't change anybody. All I can do is tell them. I got to somehow keep a smile on my face the best I can. Until I get to the end of this thing and then go see Jesus, and hopefully I can be, have a smile on my face. I'm going to be happy to get in heaven anyways. I mean, I'm going to be tickled pink just to get in heaven. 
Uh, but I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid to walk in front of him. I, he gave me a pound, and I want to be able to take him something back. Now, people say, well, you can't ever do enough to pay Jesus back for what he did. I don't care. I haven't really messed up so bad that he put me on the shelf yet. At least I don't think he has. So I got another day to try to do something more. And another day, and another. That keeps me perfectly busy. I got more. I don't have enough time. I was reading about my Social Security. 60, Sandy comes and says, you got to watch how much you make. That, that's their excuse for not giving me a pay raise. You got to watch how, not, how much you make. Because if you make any more, they're going to drop your Social Security. I'm like, yeah, but I'm 60, at 65, 66 and a half. I looked it up. 66 and a half, six months. That's next May. I can make all the money I want. <laughs> you guys are going to give me a raise then. No, ha, ha. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, man. It's like I've, I've watched the Lord take care of me for, 60, for 65 years. I can't even believe it. I just can't believe it. And I still get to do whatever I want to do, however I want to do it all day long. I mean, it's great, man. And he provides. He provides all the stuff I ever wanted. I've, I've never wanted for nothing for 65 years. Nothing. I've had all I've ever needed. I've got more than what I want. I've never had to ask for nothing from him. He just gives it. And then you know what I found out? If you give it back and give it away, he gives you more. And you just keep doing that, man. Pretty soon you can't keep, you can't keep up with him. There's a method. He says, behold, I send you forth as sheep. In the midst of wolves. You know, this whole world's a bunch of wolves, man. A preacher once said this. <laughs> he said, you need about, oh, what is it? let me finish this. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as a dove. You got to be pretty smart, man, when you go into this world. Uh, you got to realize that you're here for a purpose. It's a point that a man wants to die. You never know when that day is going to be. Everybody's going to die one of these days. I mean, get, it, get over it. Get over it. You're going to bite the big one. That's why they make coffins. Man, I worked for a company. <laughs> we were down in Florida. Or in, yeah, we were in Florida, Pensacola. And I, went, I used to go on the way home, man. Beth, Beth thought I was dying all the time. I'd stop at all the pawn shops on the way home. Just, I'm looking for good deals. I'm sorry. So I go in this one. It's like you got to go down the road here and down in, the, in this ditch area. And you get down. It's, it's like it's gloomy. Ooh, it looked like uh, the Adams Family type of thing. And uh, so I get in there to the pawn shop. And they got two old wooden caskets. It looked like... Dracula caskets is what they look like. That's what Beth I said. We ought to get these things, man. We'd be all ready and prepared to everything. And <laughs> she thought I was nuts. I was just joking. But, I mean, these things were all wooden, and, and they looked like they were like 12 foot, probably for Goliath and his brother or something. But uh, I worked for a company, Crane Pro Services, and they sent us out to Clark Grave Vault in Springfield to work one day. And I go up inside. I mean, these, these cranes are all overhead, and they're probably 30, 40 foot off the ground, and and this place, as far as the eye can see, is a warehouse full of caskets and grave vaults, the concrete grave vaults. I looked at Roland, and we're working on it, and we're going down through there working. I said, Roland? He said, yeah. I said, if we fall off this thing, I just hope I don't fall in a pink one. I said, but if I could get a blue or a gray, they just close the lid and take me out and bring a vault with it, and we're done, man. I said, this is the best place to work in the whole wide world. An accident is over the moment you hit the ground. <laughs> You talking about eerie, man. You know what that, I mean, this place was just like caskets everywhere. You know what that tells you? Somebody's using those things up. And that's going to be us one day. But there's nothing to fear. I don't know why anybody would fear death. I might fear how I go, go out, but I, I mean, as far as going out, that's it. He says, uh, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. Who cares? And they will scourge you in the synagogues. I had somebody recently said they were going to destroy me. Fine, go for it, man. I said, I've been trying to do that to me forever. And ye, you, can't, you can't get by God. How are you going to get by God, man? The Lord will take care, he'll take care of you and me both. Maybe we both need to be destroyed. I don't know. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. That's what Paul, man, I like, you ever read your Bible? The day Paul got saved, he told, he told uh, Ananias to go tell him, that he's going to have, and he says down through there, you're going to stand before kings. I'm going to bring you before Caesar. Nothing's going to happen. Now, now, the life Paul had wasn't the pleasant all the way through, but he said, you're going to Rome. And it doesn't matter what happens to you until then. You're going to Rome. You know what you can trust? God's going to get you someplace, and you don't have to worry about it. He's got you down. He knows exactly what is. 
Verse 19 says, but when they deliver you up, take no thought of, of, thought of how you will or what you will say, you shall speak. For it shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak. Have you ever been in a place where you didn't know what to say and all of a sudden the words were just like right there? I've been there a bunch of times. I mean a bunch of times. One, real, one of my favorites one is the, in that cheese mess. I was praying. I just said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I done messed up. You told me what not to do, and I done messed up. <laughs> all by myself in a room with 70 men. I thought they were all men. Not a one of them would stand up for Jesus Christ. There's Navy SEALs in there. I'm sitting there going, oh, God, what do I do? What do I do? If I do this, you're going to get mad at me. If I do this, they're going to get mad at me. I don't really care about them getting mad at me, but I should not even be here because you told me what not to do, and I did it, and I'm, I'm telling you, I felt a finger in the bag. I can feel my shirt on my Adam's apple. You say, oh, you're just making that up. Okay, you just wait till we get to heaven. I'll show him. I mean, I can, it's like somebody picking me up, man, like this. And I get up, and next thing you know, the words were right there. Whatever they were, I got kicked out of the chief's mess. It didn't matter. <laughs> it was fun. I'm still laughing about it today. It's great. An old preacher once said, you need about four serpents to one dove. You need to be wise as a serpent. You know, if, if Satan is less than God, which he is, and I'm a son of God, I, there's some wisdom that I have that's above what he has. I got, I got a source that he doesn't have access to. And all you have to do is stop here and let the Holy Spirit tell you what to do. And, brother, I'm telling you, you can get by with all kinds of stuff. The serpent's appearance. This is who you're dealing with, by the way. Now, if you're in here today and you, you say, well, I just go to church on Sunday morning, just go to church on Sunday morning, that's all I do. I'm telling you, this is who you're dealing with. He's really here. He's a real live being out there ready to get you. Go ask the, the maniac of Gadara. He had 2,000 of them in him, the devils, devils little. I mean, he was full of the devil. That's called full. That's full to the top. Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, And marvel not, and no marvel, for Satan himself transformed an angel of light. You can't tell who you're looking at, whether they're of God or they're not. That book has to, the, the book will do it. This thing right here, I've watched this book flush people out left and right, man. I, this is a crazy book. This is the craziest thing in the whole wide world. This thing just does it. I mean, it just does it all by itself. All you have to do is, here, use this thing. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, we sit there and think that just because somebody says I'm a Christian, that you can, you can trust what they do. Really, here's what the deal is. We're looking for justification to do what we want. So then once we get that justification, we look for somebody who's doing what we want, and then we say, well, they're doing it. I can do it. It's okay. Look at them. No, it's not. Watch it. Oh, you're going to hate me on this one. He's, uh, he, to get, he, you know what the serpent's purpose is? Here's four serpents. I'm going to give you He wants you to sin against God. That's what he did to Eve. You know, he couldn't make Eve sin. He said, yea, hath God said. What he did is he gave Eve the opportunity to reply back to him. And when she did, she goes, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. True. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither touch it. She changed the word of God. He, and then once he got her to change the word of God, then he went back to her. We give the devil the ammo against us. We don't have to do it. I like Job. It said, In everything Job said, he didn't sin against God. The Lord, get, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord told Satan, Satan tried to get Job to blaspheme. You know what, he just sent his wife in there. Guys, you got to watch your wives, man. They'll come in here and they'll tell you to do something that I mean, you need to just shut them down. Ladies, you got to watch your husbands. Keep us out of trouble. That's what you got to do. It's, 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 he said he made you one. You're not two, you're one. You better make sure you get the right one. Otherwise, it's going to take a long time to figure out how to make that thing fit. I hate a thousand-piece puzzle. <laughs> Ugh. Mike came up with a puzzle a while back and gave it to somebody, man, but it was like, it wasn't even square. That is the word. I mean, this thing was like, not, I don't know where it was. That's the puzzle out of hell is what that was. <laughs> and then he gives it to you and says, I, I, I don't know where that thing's going. You give it to me, I'm going to throw it in the trash can. I just <laughs> Bess got this table at home, and it's, she uses it for her puzzles. So I take it down in the basement, I've loaded up with computers. I don't even want to see a puzzle in my house. She came down yesterday and told me she wanted her table back. Well, empty the table if you can have it. Stephen, Stephen was over there. You want the dove side of it? Stephen said he's, they looked at him, he's full of the Holy Ghost. Now, I said all that to say this. Luke 15, 16, 15 says this, and he said unto them, 
yea, are they, yea, are they which justify yourselves before men? Oh, yeah, and he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, God gives you a verse like that, and you need to stop and look at that thing. And all you have to do is look what this world thinks is big, and you can pretty much bottom dollar say that thing is bad. And there's no way, there's no way on God's earth you're going to justify that thing. There's no way. There's no way you can't do it. TV is of the devil. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's a hell of vision. I got one. It needs to go in the trash can. I keep saying that. One of these days I'm going to get enough guts to do it. My wife won't let me. But uh, <laughs> it was, she's going to leave one day and go to Kentucky with my mom. I'm going to get rid of her, everything. I, maybe that's a good way to get rid of Esther. I don't know. But... <laughs> <laughs> But I'm telling you, man, there's no way you can justify anything pretty much this world. If this world sees it as a great thing, he says right there, it's anything, uh, he says, for that which is highly esteemed among men. Now, there's two men. If I ask anybody in here who the greatest baseball player that ever was, was, you'd say Babe Ruth. If you know it. And I know very little about baseball, but I know it's Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was a mess. Him, there's another guy named Billy Sunday. And both of those guys lived about the same time frame, within about 30 years apart. Babe Ruth come up through a Catholic seminary type thing, and uh, he, was, he was mentored and got into baseball, and they said he's one of the greatest baseball players ever lived, if not the greatest. This is what they said about him. If sport has become a national religion, then which, you know what, you know, you know what sports is in our country? It's a religion. That's exactly what that thing is. This is what they said about Babe Ruth. If sports has become a national religion, Babe Ruth is the patron of the saints. It's like St. Peter, St. Paul, whatever. St. Babe Ruth. He stands at the heart of the game he played, the promise of a warm summer night. Doesn't it sound great? A bag of peanuts and a beer. And just maybe the longest ball hit out of the park. A detective now, this is Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth had a drinking problem. He would never, he, I don't think he would ever, they tried to get him to do beer commercials, he wouldn't do it because he knew that he was, at least he had that part, he knew that he was an example to the kids in the nation. They, the, the, the Yankees hired a detective to follow him, and, he was, and, and they said that night he was with six women after the ball game. Six different women. His, his, he run, his wife left him because of that. His roommate, Ping Bodie, said that, uh, that he was not Ruth, uh, Ruth, Babe Ruth's roommate while traveling. He said, I roomed with a suitcase. He was always gone, out drinking. That is what we watch. That is what we sit there and look. There's another guy named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday did the same thing up to a certain point. Billy Sunday was just like everybody else. I mean, he was a baseball player. He said on Sunday afternoon in Chicago during, uh, during either the 1986 or 1987 baseball season, so it was about the same time, uh, Babe Ruth come along about 30 years later, uh, baseball season. Sunday, uh, Sunday and several of the teammates were out in town on their day off. At one street corner, they stopped to listen to the gospel preaching team from the Pacific Garden Mission. I've been in that church. That's a, that's a big place, man. That mission is a great big place. Attracted by the hymns. You know why we have the old hymn book? That's what gets them. This new trash out there is garbage. All that does, it appeals to the flesh. This right here appealed to the spirit of a lost man that's a baseball player that's wicked as hell. Attracted by the hymns, he heard his mother. Moms, what are you singing to your kids? What are you doing? You influence those kids way before they ever get to where they're at. What they are is what they, they've been input, or God's going to have to work that thing out like he did in me. He said, follow, uh, he said uh, attracted by the hymns, he heard his mother uh, sing. Sunday began, began attending services at the mission. Following his conversion, Sunday denounced drinking, swearing, gambling, and he changed his behavior. Which was, that's, that's normal for a Christian. Which was recognized by both his teammates and fans. Shortly thereafter, Sunday began speaking in churches and, and baseball went out the window. Brethren, our sports, we look at those people. You know what, what generated, I'll tell you what generated this message. I had a, uh, a man walk up to me this week. 
that wouldn't darken the door of most churches anywhere. And he said, did you see the Super Bowl? I said, no, I didn't see it at all. He goes, he said, I cannot believe the halftime show. How can we possibly justify? Well, there's Christians playing football. No, there aren't. They're made saved. I'm not saying they're not saved. You cannot be in that environment and live in that environment and strive in that environment and thrive in that environment and tell me you're a God-fearing Christian Bible believer. You can't do that. You cannot do it. That is an impossibility. And for me to go on either side of that thing and have a halftime show that's filthy as the devil days long sitting there and saying football's okay on either side of that, we got a problem, man. And then we wonder why our country is the way it is. We've done made it a religion, and we're justifying the game over what went on. That's just, that's not even counting hockey and baseball and soccer and football overseas and all the other stuff. Or TV, Hollywood. Come on, man. It's, it's, I'm preaching to myself, too. There's lost people out there. This, and, and we're sitting there, we're not doing anything different than what they're doing. Why in the world would they listen to us? Boy, when they see something like Billy Sunday or they see something like uh, Watchman Knee or they see something about Harlem Popoff, I love Dr. Rutman, man. That guy just, he, I marveled at that old man. Sunday afternoon, go out street preaching on the street, go right where you tell him. He just sat there. He, when he couldn't even see no more Harley, he'd get out there with a cane. Old man, still with a cane, preaching the Bible on a street corner somewhere. I remember him laying in his bed, man. They used to bring in teaching. That man's just, just a teacher. He couldn't see no more. His eyes was his life. And they brought these big things, and they tried to make the letters this big so he could see it. He just couldn't do it. His whole life was that way. You know what his life? He had opportunities to become all kinds of stuff, and he just junked them. Why? For Jesus Christ. I'll never be like that, ever. And I know that's not what God has me to do. I got that. But I tell you what, he has some stuff for me to do that I can do. And that's what I'm going to focus on doing. And when he takes me out of here, I'm done. The decision. Acts 20:20, 20, 20, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable. This, everything I said today is profitable. You might not like it. You might not agree with it. You might go out of here and turn the TV on and watch another football game, basketball game, baseball game, whatever's on. You know, have you ever noticed this after this sport's over, that sport's on this? It's something to keep you busy all the time. But the people never change. The people that are in those are what we're teaching our kids to watch and do. I'd rather, I, you know what is a blessing? I'll tell you what a blessing was. I was in that bathroom, that ladies' bathroom. It's okay, there were no ladies here. <laughs> the church was empty. The door was open. And I was in there laying floors. And Andrew came in and Bella came in. And Bella was watching me do what I was doing. And she said, Grandpa? I said, yeah. She said, can you remodel our Sunday school class like that? <laughs> I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> but here she is in church, and she knows what her class looks like. She knows what that bathroom looked like before. She knows what it looks like now. She knows what the Sunday school rooms look like. She knows what the nursery looked like. And you know what? She, she's like, I would rather sit there and have my granddaughter ask me, can we do this over here and get her started at a young time and in the church than to have her out in this world skating or playing games? or doing? Hey, I think music is great. You ask my kids, I said them all... They, they all wanted to go play baseball, basketball. I said, no, you find your own way there. I didn't stop at one of them. Go play whatever you want to play. If you want to, you ain't going to take my time. You say, oh, you're selfish. No. If I leave my kids something, I want to leave them a church. I want their grand, I want my grandkids to know what a church is. You say, well, they may leave. They may do that. I can't make them stay. But I want them to at least know what one was. The best I could do. I want to get preachers in here that will preach to them, and they'll know that they heard a preacher. I want them to be exposed to as many things as they can get exposed to so that they'll see some things. And maybe down the road somewhere, the Lord will work in their life. He said, and Acts 20 says, and I have kept back nothing, Paul said this, that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what you got to do? You got to put Jesus in there. Brethren, our job is a simple job. I'm going to shut up right here. I could go on. I got some other stuff. Our job is a simple job. David Brainerd said this. Missionary to the American Indian once said, I care not where I live or what hardships I go through so that I can uh, but gain souls to Christ. 
While I am sleeping, I dream of those things. As soon as I awake, the first thing I think of is this great work. All my desires is the conversion of sinners, and all my hope is in God. I'm not saying you have to be that way. But, boys, you ought to be thinking about somebody that you want to get saved. I talk about Fanny Crosby all the time. Fanny Crosby is an amazing lady. One time, Fanny Crosby, she was a blind hymn writer. Everybody knows that. She visited Macaulay Mission in New York. She asked if there was a boy, and you all have heard me say this one before, if there was a boy who had no mother or if he would come up and lay, let her lay her hands on his head and pray with him. A motherless fellow came up, and she put her, put her arms around him and kissed him. She went from the meeting and wrote. She wrote this song. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. And it goes on. Snatch them in pity from sin and from grave. That's where she got that song. Later, another name, Miss Sankey, which was Moody's song director, song leader, uh, was about to sing in St. Louis. He related the, the incident. A man sprang to his feet in the audience and said, I'm the boy. <laughs> he said, I'm that boy she kissed, man. I was there that day. And he's still serving Jesus Christ that, all the way down through there. You know what Fanny Cross, a blind lady, made an appeal at a mission to anybody that didn't have, and she gave some qualifications. If you don't have a mom, come up here and just let me kiss you and pray for you. And when she did, she got a song that, out of that thing that she didn't intend to get, but she got one. And here's Sankey down the road a ways, and that little boy that is now a young man walks up and says, I was that boy. You tell, I'll tell you what, that probably filled Sankey's soul, and that probably filled that boy's soul, and Fanny Crosby, man, she's done got enough blessing. William Bruce was asked by King Edward the, the Seventh to write in his, his uh, autograph, 1904, uh, and he wanted him just to autograph it, and he said, Your Majesty, some men's ambition is art, some men's ambition is fame, some men's ambition is gold, my ambition is the souls of men. Now, Booth, you can say all you want to say about Booth. You can say he was wrong here, wrong there. I said he had the right ambition. What's your ambition today? The, the gift that we have, is, which is least, and I want to, I'm going to I'll give you my message title again, and I'll shut up. The servant's least developed ability is his greatest duty. My least developed, you know what you got to do? You got to develop a soul winning attitude. You got to see that, hey, this world will. There's a billion things. It's not just sports or it's not just TV. It's everything that is in our lives. It's to take moment by moment by moment by moment away. And pretty soon your life is gone. And you're old and gray and I'm 65. And I can still remember when I joined the Navy. I can still remember sitting in that trailer 43 years ago signing the paperwork to join the Navy. I can remember that. I can remember join, going to work at McDonald's. I can remember going to work at Consolidated Sales. I can remember every single, my life is gone. You say, oh, you're 65. Somewhere down the road, surely it's going to be over. That's why I thank God every day. I said, man, I get up today, get something else to do, get it done, move on to the next thing. Next, 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 next. You say, you're working too hard. No, I'm just trying to do something for him. To leave something behind like the apostles left behind for me. You know what we need to do? One of them was a traitor. There's one thing I don't ever want to be is a traitor. I want to get on the train. I mentioned that this morning. Sunday school. I mean, 1980, I got on a train. I looked for that train. I was looking for the train station. I had no idea where the train station was or the train. 1980, I found the train. I got on the train. The train's headed to heaven. You know, Dr. Robin always said, I'll never forget it. He says, get on the train. Don't ever get off. Train pulls into the port. In, in port. I keep saying port. Pulls into the train station. Some get on, some get off. Don't get off. Just stay on. If you have to get off for a moment, there is really there's no reason to ever get off. What could I actually be out there to get off that train? But that's what people do. They'll get off the train. Maybe they'll get back on and another, another that train will go on, another one will come on. Maybe they'll get back on. But what what why get off the train? Stay on the train. Are you on the train today? Or if if you died tonight, let me ask you a question. If you died tonight, are you sure you'd go to heaven? And if you say, yes, I know I'm going to heaven, let me ask you a question. Do you have people around you that if they die tonight, you don't know if they would go? God is going to hold us responsible for that. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Lord, I think time is short. I really do think it's short. And we don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, Lord, I thank you for just the church. I thank you for this sign out there, Lord. Uh, at least everybody who drives by, they can get 
uh, a gospel message or they can get something on that sign to make them think a little bit more about you. Lord, help us to fill our pockets with tracks and everywhere we go to put tracks out and tell people about you. Get, Lord, give us the wisdom uh, to understand how to do it. Uh, Lord, uh, give us the desire, but Lord, give us the, the desires in our heart, Lord, and, and the, the vision, Lord, of the lost world. You said, he that winneth souls is wise, Lord, so help us to be wise. Lord, I want to shine like a uh, star in the firmament. Lord, I want to be what you'd want me to be, and Lord, down here. Sometimes you just got to let some things go, uh, Lord, so we can get some other things in our lives that are more important. Father, this world is crazy, uh, Lord, but the world knows it's crazy. That man who came up to me the other day, Lord, knew that the world is crazy, knew that everything else was crazy. And he asked me, why is this crazy, Lord? Well, this is the reason why. And, Father, the, the, you're not in most of anything. That which is highly esteemed among man is an abomination in the sight of God. Most everything this, we do in this world is an abomination to you. Lord, help us to be like Paul, Peter, James, John, and all those men that walked away from that stuff, and uh, like Billy Sunday. Lord, Babe Ruth, great ball player. Lord, can't take anything away from him for that. But, Lord, his life uh, depicted nothing compared to what Billy Sundays did. Uh, Lord, help us to have a, a life similar to that. And, Father, we'll praise you on you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen.